Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. I'm Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show, and today my guest is Sarah Wildman. Um, Sarah is a visiting scholar at the International Reporting Project at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and she is just back from Jerusalem on a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. And in advance of President Obama's trip to Israel, we're going to talk about some of her reporting in Jerusalem uh, about the status of Jerusalem and its role in the peace process and just how contested uh, everything remains, even though nobody involved in the peace process seems to really want to talk about that. So, um, well, tell me just very broadly um, what what sorts of things you were reporting on when you were in Jerusalem. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, as you said, the, the idea behind the trip and that Pulitzer decided to cover was to look at Jerusalem itself. I mean, generally, we think about Jerusalem as something to be decided down the line. And this has been true since pre-Oslo, but certainly Oslo and on, which was that Jerusalem would be decided after final status or as part of final status, um, that we would think about the West Bank first and we would think about all these other issues before Jerusalem. But, of course, Jerusalem, just like refugees, is a sort of third rail in both the peace process negotiations and in thinking about uh, what a final, you know, two-state solution would look like. The problem was, you know, over the last 20 years, it, Jerusalem itself as a puzzle piece to be fit into the puzzle at the very end has not stayed static, and that shape has not stayed static. And so Jerusalem itself is a puzzle that needs to be solved for the peace process to continue, and it needs to be considered in order for negotiations to go forward. But it's something that nobody ever wants to talk about. And so I went looking at a couple of different things. One is I'm doing a big profile of Daniel Seidman for Newsweek. He is the director of an NGO called Terrestrial Jerusalem, which kind of monitors the maps and kind of pays attention very, very, very closely, closer, some say, than anybody else does, to how the borders of Jerusalem are changing, how settlement building is progressing, both in the east, um, in what's considered, you know, sort of greater Jerusalem, Malé uh these sort of areas around the edges of Jerusalem, including um, Givat HaMatos, Har Homa, and um, then the much more con controversial kind of newer, n sort of what's old as new again area known as E1, which is right. between Malé Adumim and Mount Scopus. And this is the area that if settlement building took place there would basically ensure the impossibility of, uh, it, ensure, the imp ensure the impossibility of, a, a, a contiguous state for the Palestinians. Exactly. I mean, Danny Seidman's point is that E1 is the sort of fatal heart attack of the, of the <laughs> two-state solution. Um, and, you know, each of these different, he has, he has lots of wonderful metaphors for everything, but um, that this would cut off uh, the ability of a, you know, a, a single contiguous Palestinian state alongside a Jewish state. Um, it would sort of create cantons, you know, to the north and south. And, it would it would segment uh, the the land itself so that you couldn't so that there would be no way for you to travel from point A to point B um, in within a Palestinian state. Now, for the time being, at least for the time being, being the president's the U.S. president's trip to Israel, there's been no discussion by the Israeli government of actually building an E1. But it's not like they've promised that they will never build an E1, right? Well, so what happened was this E1, which I hadn't fully understood until I was just there again, was actually a Sharon plan. It's been around for a long time. It has been floated several times. And in some ways, it's often the trial balloon as to where the Americans are on Jerusalem itself. And then it's been shelved several times. And E1 was floated in November by the Netanyahu government, um, as a bit of a thumb in the eye of the, of the Americans, but also the Palestinians. Um, in fact, there were some news reports just this past week that in advance of Obama coming, they are once again um, putting these plans on ice, at least for right now. I mean, so at least this two-week period, no one's going to talk about it. That doesn't mean it's totally on hold. Um, I mean, it's 
you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, most people within that Danny Seidman community feel that it is, you know, it, it is, it's crucial that you would not be built. Some of the Americans are less certain, uh, but yet, right, as of right now, there is no conversation about moving forward with it, but it is because no one wants to see neither the Israelis nor the Americans another moment like what happened to Biden when he first came a couple of years ago and, right. you know, was shocked that they announced 1,600 new units of building sort of the, the day he arrived. Now, and many believe that actually Netanyahu himself was not aware of it. It's, it's some it's a sort of strange collection of one hand not talking to the other, but the Americans were not pleased, as you can imagine, to be surprised with this visit and have, you know, new building units and settlements announced the day that Biden was right. showing up. But, but even with this E1, talk, the talk of E1 being off the table for now, it's so typical in a way of this whole situation that, oh, we're not, we're just, you know, it's, it's not off the table, but it's not on the table. And that doesn't mean that we won't, you know, bring it up later when the president isn't here, which is sort of like, you know, it's almost like, well, you know, if he's not there, he still won't, he'll still know that it's happening. But um, I guess it makes it less diplomatically fraught. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, so so they put E1 to the side for now, but at the same time, you've got the new coalition government, mm -hmm. um, you know, and there was a lot of hope that it would be a little bit more to the center with the Ishatid in mm -hmm. the coalition. But then you have the new housing minister who's with the uh, Jewish Home Party right. who came out and said, you know, settlement freezes. Are you kidding me? We're not going to sell freeze settlements. Right. We're just going to keep building. Right. So, you know, in the reality and the, and the reality and the reality. Well, I mean, I think that there's a couple of things. There's been a lot of kind of cautious optimism around the new coalition and Yeshatid and um, Lapid coming in. And, and there are a handful of interesting new MKs, members of Knesset, um, especially a handful of young women, mm -hmm. you know, Merav Mechayeli, mm -hmm. um, Stav Shafir. Um, I think that, that there, are, there are a couple of issues. I mean, one is Lapid is a little more representative of – the kind of cost of living uh, anxieties that Israelis had, um, you know, that were with the protests of the summer of 2011, the tent protests on Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv, and then, mm -hmm. you know, there were protests around the country. And those were much more about kind of quotidian issues, you know, sending my kid to school, being able to buy an apartment. Um, I mean, a lot of the issues we face here in America. Um, they were notable for not addressing the conflict um, and not addressing the, the occupation. And in fact, they were criticized from the left for not addressing the occupation and not uh, working on that at all. And Lapid himself has not seemed to be particularly interested in taking on the occupation. Um, so while this is, it is a more hopeful coalition because it's not quite as far right as, as what we had seen in the past. And of course, Netanyahu did not get the blank check he had hoped for or expected. Um, there, the fact that, you know, obviously his housing minister and a handful of the other ministers are so pro-settlement or are from the settlements themselves mm -hmm. um, does not indicate that settlement building is off the table by any stretch. And if anything, it has become this strange... Uh, bit of a swagger on the part, I think, of the Israelis to sort of not have to stop settlement building. I mean, it has become something that has, you know, is it's a constant, it's a constant thorn between the Obama administration and the Netanyahu administration, you know, sort of proving we can do what we need to do right. um, without, without anybody pushing us around. And, you know, what Settlement was, not machismo almost, right? I, I mean, it's, it seems that way to me. I mean, it's interesting because Obama didn't say anything that others hadn't said before, and somehow uh, the Netanyahu government decided to take it and run with it as, you know, you're interfering in, in our affairs in ways that, you know, you can't. Um, and there has been an explosion of building over the last 10 or 15 months that has, it's unrivaled. I mean, what what the monitors of these, of settlement building, including Danny Simon, say is that we haven't seen a uh, building like this since the 70s. And so, and we're looking at all across, I mean, you're looking at all across all the flanks of Jerusalem. You know, Danny took me out and we drove the perimeters. Well, let's talk about that. I would love it if you could describe the geography, because I think even if you've been to Jerusalem as a tourist, 
Right. Uh, it's probably hard to uh, visualize what you're talking about. Because if you've been there as a tourist, you've probably you know, been to the Old City, you've probably been to Mount Zion, you've probably been to the Mount of Olives and so on, um, and the modern parts of Jerusalem. And, you know, if you've been to uh, Mount Zion or the Mount of Olives and, you know, you've looked around yourself, <laughs> you've right. seen what you're talking about, but it's not part of the, it's not part of what a tourist normally sees. So right. Right. orient us to, to where to where it is that that Seidman took you and showed you. Well, I think there's, there's something interesting, which is one is where Seidman took me, and the other is where um, a couple of these of archaeologists took me as well. So what you're actually seeing is that you have internal, in that kind of core Old City Basin and Mount of Olives, Mount Scopus, um, mm-hmm. kind of nexus of the center, like the beating heart of, his, of Jerusalem, um, which is also facing certain challenges from settlers, um, and then you see it at the edges. So for me, what was the initial thing that was incredibly striking, because you know, I've been to Israel many, many times, and I lived in Israel when I was younger, and one of the things you first see is that the drive down to Bethlehem has totally, totally changed. Uh, the landscape has totally changed. First of all, of course, you have, you know, the the wall, the mm-hmm. wall itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they have done is there is this kind of really creepy... Um, security sleeve which can bring you down to Keva Rachel where the Rachel it's believed to be Rachel's tomb mm-hmm. um, it protects Israelis so that they can go down and pray to it pray at it if they want to but it literally dips inside of Bethlehem and so that so you have a you know the slicing out of that and just on the other side of the wall you know olive groves it's kind of this sort of iconic images of what you think of as a problem, you know, and, you know, I, olive groves are, belong to Bethlehem residents that they can't reach and that they're constantly trying to negotiate for extra, um, you know, permits to be allowed to harvest their own olives. But then beyond that, you look a little bit further north and you see um, Harhoma, which was very, very controversial in the 90s, um, in the early part of the last decade. And this in a newer building in something called Giva Tomatos. And Harhoma is, it actually is, it's sort of horrible but beautiful at the same time. I mean, it's very ticky tacky. It's a very specific look. There's a look to these new settlements. Um, I mean, they're they're done in this, you know, this beautiful Jerusalem stone. They all have these great uh, mirpesets, you know, these the porches. Um, and it's relatively sort of middle to low income housing. And certainly some of it is necessary. Um, but when I asked, you know, why doesn't anything get built towards the west, towards Mevetzeret Sion, you know, out onto the road towards Tel Aviv, and it was, you know, the environmentalists argue that that would destroy the green lung of Jerusalem. I, I'm not sure why taking over hill after hill towards Bethlehem doesn't do that, but, you know, this is the argument. The bigger issue, though, is that you see this incredible amount of building in Har Hama and other areas, and then just over the road, I mean, within two minutes, you're in Sarbacher, which is an Arab village, which the road hasn't been paved. I mean, the people there that we spoke to said it hadn't been paved since the Jordanians. Now, that may be an exaggeration, but it certainly hasn't been recent. It's a, you know, it's mm-hmm. a mess. Right. But more than that, they don't have enough schools. Um, you know, they've sued several times to have their children be able to go to a public school. They don't have classrooms. They can't build. They can't get building permits. And then it's this incredible juxtaposition between the two sides where you have this incredible amount of building right. on the one hand and then no building permits, no schools on the other. I mean, you can see the building of tension in, in, before your eyes, I mean, in the car, in the dust. And you know, there's another big project that's going on right now in something called Beit Safafa, which is a very, very old Arab village, also at the kind of Bethlehem side of Jerusalem, which their village has been there forever. I mean, and they are building a highway, a four-lane highway through it that will connect the settlements. So the Israelis are building a four-lane highway through this Arab village, uh, this Palestinian village, so that settlers can get from Jerusalem to the West Bank. No, so they can get from Tel Aviv to the West Bank without from stopping. Tel Aviv to the West Bank. Yeah, it'll connect eventually to the Tel Aviv system. Mm-hmm. So that right now, you know, you have a couple of different roads. One is the 443, which cuts into the West Bank, and you go through a checkpoint to get back out towards Tel Aviv. The other is Route 1, and then they want to build another one. It, it makes sense. I mean, this the country's, you know, congested. There's a lot of cars. The problem is that they're building it directly through this village. And it's a village that has always, you know... Danny referred to them as, as sort of, 
you know, they, they, they've been around forever. I mean, they're, they're not, they haven't been agitating in any way. They weren't seen as protesters. Now there have been protests. I mean, now there have been, you know, there was a lot of anxiety over the last couple of weeks that whether a third intifada would begin. Right. And a lot of people said, oh, no, that's very exaggerated, blah, blah, blah. It is the kind of instigating factor that would create, um, you know, that creates sparks. I mean, there's sort of matches being lit everywhere. You know, the other piece of it is, um, you know, we were in, it was with him, but also with other activists in um, in Sheikh Jarrah, which is the neighborhood just south of the American Colony Hotel in the east. It's a peculiar neighborhood because actually... Well, in East Jerusalem. Right? In East Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. In East Jerusalem. Um, it's a peculiar neighborhood because prior to 1948, it actually was Jewish. Um, I mean, some mixed, but it was Jewish. Um, and then Jews left. Uh, it's one of the few neighborhoods that you can kind of really track in the same way. The Jews left, and UNRWA, the UN Organization for Refugees, and the Jordanians leased the land to 28 Palestinian families. Then in 67, when when Israel uh, reclaimed Jerusalem, the area obviously came back under Israeli control, the families remained, and they're protected um, under custodianship laws and tenancy laws. But International laws or Israeli laws? Well, both, except that Israeli law also doesn't protect them, and this right. is basically the big problem, which was mm-hmm. that Israeli law allows for Jews who can claim land that there was Jewish before 48 uh, to reclaim it in some way. It's you know Israeli law allows Jews to reclaim formerly Jewish properties, which Palestinians can't do. Um, it would be a, a huge problem for Israel if they could, because obviously there are properties all over the west of Jerusalem, but also Haifa and Akko. And, I mean, mm-hmm. there's right. places all over that you could say, well, my family was from here, and mm-hmm. so therefore I'd like this back. The Palestinians can't do it, and Jews can. Most Jews don't, but it has become, Sheikh Jarrah became a cause for certain radical settler groups um, over the last, since around 2009, I would say. But from between 2009 and 2011, there were, there was a large group of Jews who sort of fought back alongside the Palestinians, and they called themselves Solidarity, um, and they had major protests every Friday, and they and this was to streets. try to prevent the Israelis from expelling Palestinians from their homes. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, you know, you have these families, and, and the houses are not, you know, it's not because these are great houses. I mean, these are very, very small houses that a lot of people live in. Um, they're difficult conditions. It's peculiar because it's a diplomatic quarter. Um, the area of Sheikh Jarrah is in this little sort of dip in the valley, below Mount Scopus and mm-hmm. a bunch of hotels like the Ambassador Hotel mm-hmm. and on the one hand and on, on the other side the American Colony, which is very beautiful and, and historic. And also where a lot of I mean, journalists, foreign journalists stay when they're in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah. It. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, and it's a great place to have, like, tea in the courtyard. You know, mm-hmm. it's really peculiar how closed this is. Mm-hmm. In any case, a couple of radical settler groups started coming in and using these Ottoman era um, deeds uh, to to force out families, um, and some were successful and some weren't. Um, and so, when and you then, say force out families, they did it through judicial means as opposed to physical force. Through judicial means, and then you know physically kind of pulling people out as a result, you using you know kind of waving mm-hmm. in front of them mm-hmm. the fact that they have but a actually court on their physically side. expelling them. Yeah, but, I mean, with the court on their side. I mean, it wasn't mm-hmm. just that they, like, came in and stormed the house and forced them out, but they ha- they were able to track down means to legally, if not morally, force out families. Mm-hmm. E- each ca- the, problem, the problem with the Sheikh Jarrah story for a journalist is that each house has its own case. It's, it's very complicated and hard to boil down. Each one is a slightly different reason why the house is at risk. Um, so I sat down with a the, with the family that's been facing eviction for the past couple of months. Um, first of all, incredibly difficult moment, right? I mean, you have 12 people live in this house. Parents, um, their children, the uh, in-laws, and they live in two rooms. Not two bedrooms, two rooms. They all live there. And the house was a Jewish home before 48. Um, and what happened was the, um, you know, the, the a settler organization um, 
Arya King, who who is one of the you know kind of advocates for for forcing out Palestinians in this area, tweeted that he that it was a victory for him. I, I don't know if it actually was him or not. He didn't get back to me. Um, but in any case, the problem for this family is you are protected by two options. One is that you are protected by a kind of custodianship. If you can prove that you were in these houses before 67 um, and you were on a lease before 67, then you have a kind of almost renter's rights of some kind and you can, and lawyers can argue on your behalf. Um, and if they find heirs, which is apparently what the settler group did, they found heirs, people who had owned the house or owned the land prior to 48, um, you can still have your renter's rights somewhat trump the rights of these kind of long ago owners. Problem with this family was that between 64 and 68, there were subletters. And so they're like slightly less, see, it's like, it's so, it's so complicated. Complicated by yeah. that, right. It ends up being, but the so family, what ended up happening to this family? So they've faced eviction three times now, at least, yes, I think that's right. And they, they thought they were going to be evicted around um, New Year's of this year. Uh, and then the last minute they got a reprieve. Then they um, just got another reprieve. They, were, they had been facing a March 1 eviction, and they got another reprieve, and then I had been told that March 13th would be another date for them, and they've gotten another reprieve. So far, they've gotten all these reprieves. There is a chance, I suppose, that the high court can sort of try to say so. The problem is the law is not on their side, um, even though it doesn't seem moral. And that's when is it becoming very difficult. But with all of these things, I think that what you look at is – you know, ways in which Jerusalem itself could be a major trigger point, um, could be a way for either a third intifada to begin, or even just what will, you know, fully dismantle a possibility of a peace process. I mean, each of these elements creates fissures um, that, that become more and more difficult to resolve. Um, and obviously you have these major ones like E1 and this question of a contiguous Palestinian state, which, you know, is essential. But you also have the kind of um, both the moral and, and and actual realities of life on the ground, which are which is becoming more and more complicated by by scenarios like this, by radical settlers trying to take over a neighborhood clearly for ideological reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and then, there's, you know, there's a third area, which is Silwan, um, known as the City of David. Just right. Let's let's back up before we get yeah. to Silwan. Um, so uh, I just wanted to contextualize this, though, in in American politics, because mm -hmm. here um, and and what Obama's approach, I mean, I, I, th I doubt that while Obama's president, we get to the point of, of you know, final status and figuring out what to do with Jerusalem. But one of the reasons for that is that there's such a strong ideology among American Jews, among American evangelicals that, uh, not exclusively, but you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, that Israel is the undivided, should be the undivided capital of Israel. And there, there was, remember there was that whole brouhaha at the Democratic National Convention about the mm -hmm. language that was in the Democratic Party platform. And um, so when you, when you look at that in the, in this context that, you know, this is, this is the ideology behind what Jerusalem is, you know, mm -hmm. so, so Jerusalem can't be divided. Jerusalem can't, uh, you know, be partly Palestinian. It has to be the undivided capital of Israel. Um, never mind that, you know, embassies are in Tel Aviv and all of that. Right. Uh, and so when you see no one doing anything or, you know, there's no pressure on Israel to stop rad these radical settlers who are trying to expel Palestinians from their home, homes in East Jerusalem, and you see how this is creating this situation where there are people hoping that this becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, right, right. No right. double entendre meant with the prophecy and all of that. Well, I mean, I think certainly some of this is about creating, you know, to use a, you know, a, a cliched phrase, facts on the ground. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the thing with Jerusalem has, that has always been interesting to me is that despite our emphasis on, you know, Jerusalem as the undivided capital of, the, of of Israel and, you know, will not be divided again. And, and nobody wants to see Jerusalem look like it did between 48 and 67, which was 
um, you know, a Berlin divided capital with a mm-hmm. no man's land in the middle and barbed wire. And nobody wants to see that. On the other hand, it is two capitals currently. I mean, it is two spaces currently. You would have the majority of Israelis don't venture into the East. And while Palestinians do go West for work mm-hmm. and for other reasons, mm-hmm. you have a certain, you know, there's definitely a, a geographic, uh, Segregation isn't quite the word I want, but it's it's there's a separation uh, that between the two sides of the city that is palpable and that is conscious and that has been this way for for a couple of generations. It's not it's not an integrated city per se. And one of the reasons why you see these radical settler takeovers is that and and why it's ideology you know ideologically motivated people who move in is because. You don't see you know, your average Israeli wanting to to kind of move into one of these neighborhoods particularly. Right. I mean, you just don't. And so, the peculiar part is that you have a mythical Jerusalem, um, which is the Jerusalem on the floor of the Democratic National Convention, mm-hmm. or you know, let's face it, APAC. I mean, it's you know, you have a a kind of ideological Jerusalem, and you have the real Jerusalem. I mean, if you've been to Jerusalem in the last few years, you've seen that the light rail runs alongside, um, up the side of the old city, you know, Mm -hmm. past the Damascus Gate. This is, that's the old border. Um, and in a lot of ways that border still exists. I mean, when I was a student there, it was, you know, it wasn't super common to hang out in the East unless maybe you went to the American American colony for tea or you went to a certain potter or something like that. But, you know, the, the, the eastern parts, and especially in the eastern neighborhoods, and, and even places like Sarbacher or these, you know, these neighborhoods, the sort of more Palestinian neighborhoods of the east, of East Jerusalem, they feel more like Ramallah than they feel like the west of Jerusalem. They right. just do. I mean, everything is in Arabic. Um, you'll be more likely to see women in hijabs. I mean, it's, you are seeing a, more of an integration. I mean, some of the people I spoke to, this, there's a Haaretz writer named Nir Hassan who has written that he thinks the Palestinian population is becoming more and more Israeli and is more and more integrated um, and wants to remain, you know, kind of integrated into the city of Jerusalem and integrated into the country. And that may be, but, um, and you, you certainly are seeing a lot more kind of meandering about than you did, certainly mm-hmm. during the Second Intifada. Right. Um, but it's... But to say the city is one cohesive, like, organism is is, right. is a bit of a fantasy. It just is. Well, and let's, let's go back. Uh, I wanted to cycle back to Silwan and the city of David and the archaeological uh, disputes uh, or the archaeological propaganda. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to add something about uh, Danny Seidman first before we, we got to that, and that is I, I follow him on Twitter, and he has this really remarkable way – way of talking about Jerusalem and talking about Israel that I think is often absent in a lot of discussions, particularly the ones that take place on Twitter where your space is so limited. And that is that he is so capable of describing how he, you know, he's not, it's not like he's anti, he's not anti-Zionist. He's not anti-Palestinian. He's, you know, he doesn't think that Jerusalem should be for one or for the other. He, you know, he's a, he's a documenter and he's a, um, he's pro both sides having their religious and sacred space in Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And he has a very, uh, cohesive and coherent way of talking about that. So it's I'm, like I'm really glad that you said that actually, and I should have said it from the outset. And one of the things I find super, I didn't mean to cut you off, but mm-hmm. super fascinating about him is a, not only is he not anti zionist he is a Zionist. I mean, he mm-hmm. calls himself a Zionist. He says he does this out of patriotism. He is an Israeli patriot. Right. Right. He moved to Israel in 1973. He says it was sort of, you know, as the tail end of the 67, you know, kind of swell of, I'm going to be a part of the Zionist experiment post-67 war. And he very, very firmly believes that the health of the country and certainly the health of Jerusalem itself is predicated on the health of the three major religions. I mean, one of the things that he also points out now is that it's not just, obviously, we spend a lot of time talking about an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which we think of in binary Jewish-Muslim terms. But in fact, there's a Christian element to this. Mm -hmm. And recently, there have been provocations towards the Christian 
side of this as well, right. mm -hmm. which is to put the IDF college, which is, has been in Herzliya until now, they want to open an IDF, the IDF college on the Mount of Olives, which is causing all kinds of stress with the churches, and there's kind of all kinds of backlash against this. And in fact, you've had a number of military personnel from various countries saying that they won't be able to visit it if they put it there. It's a clear kind of, you know, flag on the ground saying this is Israeli, which is, is a bit unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, then at the same time is, is a provocation. But Danny's whole thing, I think, which is amazing, is exactly as you said, I mean, it's it's partly out of Zionism. It's it's out of a kind of liberal Zionism that we don't see that much of. And Palestinians I spoke to said, you know, that working with him makes it impossible for them to hate Israelis, which is amazing. I mean, if you mm -hmm. think about it, I mean, he just believes so firmly in the rights of each of these, of each group. And that the essential thing that makes Jerusalem, Jerusalem is this multi-layered present, past, and future. Right. Um, and that otherwise it doesn't, you know, it's one of the things I think, you know, which is about, I mean, we can get into the archaeology from this, I guess, which is that it's not just a Jewish city. I mean, and to some degree, often when we talk about, you know, Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel and will never be divided, da, 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 often there's this undertone, if not explicit overtone of this is a Jewish city. And, and of course it's, it's 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 this it's this multi-layered it's this multi-layered um, communities that that make Jerusalem so incredibly unique and difficult. I mean, and, I mean. Well, it's interesting that you say that. I can, I think because I do so much reporting on evangelicals and their end times theologies that you know when you say that the the, the subtext of the Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel is that Jerusalem is a Jewish city. Mm -hmm. I think when evangelicals talk about it, the subtext is it's going to eventually be a Christian city. It's going to be where Christ comes back and where Christ rules the world from. Right. So I think that when people say that, when people say Jerusalem is the undivided capital of Israel, they have different intentions and different meanings. Um, but, you know, I digress. Okay, let's talk about Salwan and the city of David. Um, and the archaeological dig that is going on uh, underneath there. Um, so let's let's talk geography again so people know where we're talking about. If you're standing on Mount Zion and you're basically looking down, you're basically looking down at Silwan, right? So Silwan is like, if you, if you think about um, the old city is almost like a clock, and you have Jaffa Gate at six o'clock, and the Dung Gate is at three o'clock. It's just below what we call the Dung Gate or the mm -hmm. Shar Ashpa in Hebrew. Um, so it's just off to the eastern side. If you've ever come off from the Kotel, the 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 Western Wall, and you come out that gate, that's the Dung Gate, um, and it has a kind of like a long, winding road down or mm -hmm. up. That's where Salwan is. Salwan which is also called Ir David, or City of David, is a massive archaeological dig and has been for a number of years now, for about a decade. Um, but it is not an ideological. I mean, basically, the point of the dig has been to prove that this was the ancient city where David, you know, as in King David, right. you know, right. spied, you know, Bathsheba from his rooftop and took her for herself. Um, and it has been, and if you walk into it, um, or if you take a tour of it, you will be told that this may be where David did this, and this may be where David did that. There actually hasn't been proof of David himself, which is, I mean, might be a problem for certain people. It's not a problem for the people who run the city of David, which is an archaeological group called El Ad, which has, is also a settler organization and has had the support of the Israeli Antiquities Authority. They have been challenged by um, alternative archaeologists from a group called Emek Shavet. Um, and I went around for a couple of days with a guy named Yonatan Mizrahi from Emek Shavet, which looks at what does it mean to try to distill down all the layers of Jerusalem back to what's this kind of amorphous idea of the Second Temple period, um, which is to kind of strip away all of what's happened since um, and, and they'll argue, again, a little bit like Danny does, and, and I think that they're very much in, in sync with each other, that this takes away some of the specialness of Jerusalem if it's just about 
whatever you think might have happened in the second temple period or the period that David walked on right. earth. Because obviously there's a great amount of history that came after that that is like a layer of different uh, historical events, religious belief, belief about what is sacred to different, you know, the different, uh, the three Abrahamic religions. It's not, it's not this, you right. can't be reduced to that. Right. And there's two pieces of, of your David, City of David, that, that make this a problem. One is that it distills away everything that happened between King David and the present, which is, you know, thousands of years. Right. Um, but then it, the other piece of it is that it's a modern Palestinian village that has existed. Right. Still long, certain, right. Which is called Wadi Hilva. Right. And those people are sort of, the people of the village of Wadi Hilva are being forced, are being squeezed um, they, they, first of all, they have also pro similar problems with services like garbage collection and street pavement and school creation, uh, that a lot of the Arab villages around the edges of Jerusalem face. And they face some of the same issues, although in different legal contexts as the, as the residents of Sheikh Shara, which is that you do have settlers who are trying to move in and kind of reestablish uh, a Jewish presence in this in this basin. Part well, isn't it isn't it what the ar these archaeologists are attempting to do is to establish that the the very ground beneath where these Palestinians live is not. They're trying to establish that it's not theirs because underneath is this archaeological dig that proves that this was where King David wronged with Be Be Sheba. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah. well, what they're also trying to do is build tunnels that will eventually extend from Silwan all the way through the old city, under the old, under the Jewish quarter, through the Muslim quarter to the Christian quarter, and kind of intersect and create this kind of underground system, which allows you to see, sort of see, I guess, I mean, in quotes, um, what the, you know, what antiquity was, um, and kind of bring you all the way back into a, an era of the, you know, when the Jewish kings walk the earth. But it's it's like, it's a little bit, it's Disneyland almost, right? Because, I mean, what is it that they're actually finding there? And is have they proved that this is from the period or people or events that they're claiming that it is? Yeah, Danny calls it a biblical theme park. And it, I mean, it is. I mean, first of all, you come, you walk down into it, and it's like, you know, the tinkling of a, of a lute and like these little harps and, you know, these signs everywhere that say, what, what are you looking at? You may be looking at, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, it, it's interesting. I mean, it really is this kind of disney version of history, um, which erases the people that are living there currently. Um, and it also, you know, takes away all the different layers that existed between now in the past um which you know, which seems to just fly in the face of conventional archaeology right i mean what's interesting is that the idea that archaeology itself is so political i mean basically this comes down to a question of if you own the past you own the future or you you know and you mm -hmm. you claim the present mm -hmm. and one of the problems with Solon is also that Solon wouldn't be a part of West Jerusalem if, in a final status if East Jerusalem is claimed as a Palestinian capital. Um, and this is creating a situation where it will be very, very difficult to tease that off. It has now become one of the most visited tourist sites in Jerusalem, which is an obviously highly touristed area. Something like 300 to 350,000 people visit it each year. But not only that, they also bring through tons and tons and tons of soldier groups to sort of say, this is what you're fighting for. This is the history that you represent. Well, I know that hotels in Jerusalem, I mean, they prominently display the pamphlet for the tour of the city of David. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you know, prominently displayed in the lobby so that you could see it and, and be attracted to going on the tour. I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, but the thing is, it's all very new. I mean, that's only existed in the last, it's been less than a decade that this has been a big tourist attraction. Mm -hmm. And now it's become one of the things that you see to understand the history. Part of the problem, I think, is because, and this is why it was interesting to go around with Yoni Mizrahi from Emek Shaveh, is that the old city, while we think of it as, you know, the city of antiquity and, 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 um, and the city of, you know, in and of itself, like why is the city of David the city of David and not the old city of Jerusalem? Well, the reason is because the old city of Jerusalem is actually an Ottoman Mameluk city. It's, you know, with a little bit of Roman elements here and there, some Roman mm -hmm. arches. Um, and while we have the Herodian walls, 
you know, the, the Kotel, the, the, oh my God, I keep thinking of it in Hebrew for some reason, but the Western Wall. Right. Um, and now there's another, there's something that they're calling the Little Kotel, which is like another piece of Herodian Wall, which is actually in the Muslim Quarter, and mm-hmm. they're trying to draw pilgrims to it, which is, of course, creating its own tensions, blah, blah. The problem is, what you see walking through the old city as 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 mythical and amazing and cool as it feels is is really an Ottoman Mamluk city. It's not you're not walking on David's streets. Right. And I think what they're trying to give you with the city of David is, okay, here you can see and hope and they want eventually for you to be able to walk on the streets that David walked on, you know, and the streets that, you know, Batsheva walked on and in a way that you can't do in the old city, which is, has had so many different layers of history that come in between you and King But David. that's just, you know, based on this erroneous assumption that, um, or this, this erroneous piece of propaganda that if you just dig beneath that architecture, you'll naturally find what came before, you know, and so therefore this must be where David must have dwelled. Right, 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 right. And, it, and, of and course, but even, even if that was true, right. I don't see legally, even, even if it is true, right, I don't mm-hmm. see legally what it establishes, but the fact that it's not true makes it, <laughs> makes it even worse. Right. Well, I mean, the thing is, it's like, it's neither true nor untrue. It's sort of, it's this, it's, it's fantasy Jerusalem and it's, it kind of, it proves itself. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't even, it doesn't wait for you to try to prove a hypothesis. It creates the hypothesis and, and proves it for itself. Right. It's right. not, um, that's not, it's not what it's about in some ways. And in, in many ways, it's about allowing you to enter into this alternate universe where Jerusalem is one contiguous line of Jewish presence. Um, and I think that this is something that that most of the activists of you know of the left to, to the degree that they they think of themselves as the left and I'm not sure that they all think of themselves as the left anymore right. um, you know this is what they worry about you know this is this sense of you know is it um, what does this do if if you distill out everything that's come between um, David and today, what what do you actually lose? And you you lose the kind of authenticity of the city. You lose the incredible fabric of the city. You you create incredible tensions between the modern peoples who live there currently, and and you erase the 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 histories of everybody else who's there except for those who believe in the same ideological picture and past that you do. Mm-hmm. So what Jerusalem is Obama going to be shown when he when he's there tomorrow <laughs> and the rest of the week? He's going to be at the uh, King David Hotel, which will be fully cleaned up for Passover, and he won't be able oh, yeah. to eat any bread for breakfast. What a pain. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but, you know, uh, I mean, what, what do you think Obama's going to be going, going to see? Well, first of all, he's 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 very 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 purposefully and aggressively made sure that there are no expectations for this trip. He is not restarting negotiations. He is not starting a peace process. He's coming to listen to Israelis, um, and then I suppose to Palestinians as well. If, you know, in Ramallah, what is he going to see besides the fact that next to the King David Hotel they have created this crazy looking mall um, in the last couple of years that looks like the Zurich Airport. Um, <laughs> I've never been to the Zurich airport, but okay. It is like, you know, <laughs> like those little little high-end diamond stores and like, you know, very clean. I mean, the only thing is it's all done in Jerusalem stone. So it, it adds to like the strange Disney thing that goes on with Jerusalem these days. Um, you know, look, I think that he's going to see a very carefully uh, orchestrated picture and he's going to himself also be very, very, very measured. Um He's not going to offer much. I mean, I think there's been a lot of stress about that. I mean, I, you know, both Martin Indyk and Daniel Levy wrote on Haaretz Today op-ed sort of saying that he needs to reestablish trust with the Israelis. And, and I think that's that's probably true. I mean, for for better, for better or worse, I mean, for worse, um, for what it's worth, he has, there's a great deal of mistrust of him um, among Israelis to, to a degree that I can't quite 
wrap my mind around. I mean, you know, Bush didn't, Bush the second didn't visit uh, Israel until his eighth year, I think, in, in office. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously Clinton had spent a tremendous amount of time in the region, but the, the American president's presence in the Middle East, um, while it has been very focused over the last 30 years on peace, has not always been so obviously, um, you know, about visits. I mean, Reagan you know, famously didn't visit himself. Um, I think this is more about kind of trying to at least reach again a, some sort of equilibrium that allows Israelis to listen to what he has to say or what it, what it, what an Obama second administration has to say mm-hmm. um, uh, going forward. Um, but what, what did, what did, who was it who said was saying today? Jeffrey Goldberg said that saying Israelis should understand that Obama's America's most Jewish president. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I find it very shocking that Israelis don't like him. I mean, I don't think that he's done anything that's particularly um, aggressive. Um, you know, I'm mystified by that too, but it's definitely there. It's definitely real, but I mean the, the sentiment, but I'm not sure what, Mm. You know, do they read Yisrael Hayom too much or what? It's a combination of things. It's it's reading Yisrael Hayom. It's also the way that Netanyahu walked away from the meeting around um, when he asked for a settlement freeze. And the peculiar thing is, talking to Danny Seidman, is that there was a de facto settlement freeze for about 10 months um, towards the beginning of the Obama administration that was never commented upon or pushed towards. But it was when Obama pushed for a settlement freeze that all of a sudden Netanyahu made this big kind of brouhaha over him being, you know, meddlesome, which somehow translated into him being, you know, a less pro-Israel president. Um, And then obviously you had Netanyahu make the very peculiar and I would say maladroit uh, choice of backing Romney in our elections. I mean, it's very, very odd. Mm it's a combination of things, but you certainly hear it both in the American Jewish community uh, and in Israel itself that, that he's not somehow on the side of the Americans. I mean, on the side of the Americans, on the side of the Israelis. Well, you have to hear that in the United States too. No, no, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you hear it, you hear it, you hear it quite a bit. And, I mean, in Jewish circles um, in America, that you know that he's that he's less that he's less pro-Israel. I, I can't I can't think of a single thing that he's done. If anything, I mean. There have been um, instances where he certainly backed down, um, and he certainly hasn't pushed forward. To, you know, he hasn't pushed the Israelis very, very hard on anything. Um, you know, Clinton pushed harder, but perhaps he was seen as more loving. But I don't know uh, why. I don't know. I mean, I think it's it seems it seems very, very odd to me. Um, it's almost like Obama has a higher hurdle to get over uh, in the estimation of the Israeli public, and we're obviously completely overgeneralizing here because it's not true of all Israel. Right. Well, I also think that it hasn't helped that Netanyahu casts him in that context. Um, I mean, it's not as though the Palestinians are saying, oh, Obama is our, you know, our best friend. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of the way he is portrayed both by the current right. government and, um, and by the Israeli press. I mean, not Haaretz, but the thing is, I think Americans are very skewed by primarily reading Haaretz and maybe a bit of the Jerusalem Post, um, which doesn't give you a super good impression of what Israelis themselves are reading. Haaretz is, while it's an excellent paper, it's only read by 20% of the country. It's mm-hmm. it's pretty far left. Um, I think this is more of a sense of, you know, trying to reestablish that he cares about the region, um, that it will be something that he does with the second administration, um, it's not going to be a question of um, trying to create anything at all. I mean, I think it's just much more about saying uh, this is going to be something that we should be talking about. But I, I'm here to listen to you. Tell me, right. tell me what I should tell me what I should know. It's a trip that will be diplomatic, but there won't be a lot of actual diplomacy in terms of uh, moving anything along, uh, having any real discussions about the peace process. But it will be diplomatic in the sense that. It's a, it's, a, it's to be diplomatic. Yeah. I mean, and I imagine that he'll have his moment of awe. I mean, I think we all do, you know, when you first arrive in Jerusalem or most of us, at least who have any kind of religious background or any kind of connection to the city, um, there is something 
you can understand why there's a Jerusalem syndrome. I mean, there's an energy in Jerusalem. There's a, there's a, there's a uniqueness to the city that is palpable. I mean, even, I would imagine, even if you're surrounded by the security detail that he will be surrounded by, Mm -hmm. um, where you see, you know, especially, you know, if you, if you're in the old city where you see, you know, Ethiopian and Greek Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox priests walking past, you know, uh, you know, imams and, and, and ultra Orthodox Jews and this kind of crazy intersection of these Abrahamic faiths and, um, and the, in the intensity of the space and, and amounts that, you know, has taken place there or that people believe have taken place there. It's hard not to feel in awe of it, but you know, the entire time I was in Jerusalem, I kept thinking of this poem by Yehuda Amichai called Tourists, where he talks about how, um, there's a, um, you know, what, what tourists do when they come to Israel, where they, you know, they, 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 they cry in the right places and they, and they lust after their beautiful girls. And, um, and then there's a, the t- a tour guide points to a Roman arch and says, just to the top of this man's head, who's, I should read the poem because it's, I'm ruining it. But, um, he says, you know, just to the left of this man's head, who's carrying a basket of fruit, uh, is an arch from the Roman era, and the poet says, you know, redemption will only come when he says, do you see that arch from the Roman era? It's of no importance, but just below it to the left is a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. Um, and I, I, I kept being struck by that, which is really about this essential tension between what is Jerusalem, you know, what's the present of Jerusalem, what's the mm-hmm. future, and, and and acknowledging that there are people who live there currently. People live there, right, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, listen, thank you so much for doing this. It was really, really interesting. I hope it was. <laughs> it was wide ranging. <laughs> it's no, hard, it to, good. It it's hard good. to address Jerusalem in an yes. hour. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, no, thanks for having me on again. Um, it's always nice to chat. Yes, definitely. We'll do it again. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks Sarah.